Corinthians chapter 5, which is where we're going to be starting this morning as we head to some different places in the New Testament. Welcome to 2017. Does it feel like a new year to you? I mean, I, I don't know how today really feels that much different than yesterday did, other than we're at church today, we weren't at church yesterday, but that there is something about newness that is attractive to us. You may not be aware of this, but January 1st has not always been the start of the new year. And in many cultures, it's not the start of the new year today. In fact, if you're Jewish, the Jewish calendar says today is the third of Tevis, and the new year will begin. Actually, Jews have two new years. Did you know this? They have a new year that begins on the first of Nisan, which is uh, in the springtime. It's not around March. It's the beginning of their um, uh, their ecclesiastical year. Their church year begins the first of Nisan, about two weeks before the Passover, and then their civil new year begins on Rosh Hashanah in the fall, and uh, and that happened back October 3rd and 4th. So for Jews, this is not the new year. They're already in the year 5777, and uh, they won't celebrate their second new year until here about March. The Chinese celebrate the new year on the first new moon of the first lunar month, which is sometime between June, uh, January 21st and February 21st. This year it will happen on Saturday February or Saturday, January 28th, it will be the year 4715 for the Chinese, and this is the year of the rooster, just so you know. We could go on and on. The Iranians have their own new year. The Punjabis have their own new year. The Bengalis have their own new year. There are dozens of others, but the most of the world operates off of the Gregorian calendar, and that's what we operate off of, and so that's why around the world yesterday there were New Year's celebrations, even in places where the new year won't be for a couple of months. As I said, we are people who like new things. We like fresh starts. We like new beginnings. We like when there is something new that comes along. In fact, do you remember what happened back on September 16th of this year? September 6th, that date ring a bell for anybody? Let's show a picture here. Uh, these people are waiting in line out in front of Tabi Bahamas. Uh, this is at a place called The Grove in Southern California. It's a big shopping area there. They're not waiting to go into Tommy Bahamas. They're waiting to go into the store to the right of it. Anybody know where they're going? It's the Apple store. Let's go to the next one. Yes, these people have been waiting for days. These are three people from Queens, New York. They camped up in front of the Apple store out in uh, on Fifth Avenue in New York so that they could be among the first to get the new iPhone 7. Let's go to the next one. These people, um, I th this is actually, where is this? This is either Munich or it's uh, Berlin. This is actually Berlin. This And the next one is the line in Munich. These are people in line in Munich, Germany, waiting to get their iPhones. And then... Um, uh, they had all been lying. The, the next one is a guy in Madrid, Spain. He just got his. And you can zoom in, zoom in, and you see he's got the box, the golden ticket in his hand. He's got his iPhone 7. We love new. You know what the best-selling air freshener for your car is? You know what it is, right? It's new car smell. Yes, we all want new car smell in our car. We like stuff that's new. One of the very first verses... I learned as a new Christian back in the 70s is the verse that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where I had you turn this morning. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. There's a camp up in northwest Arkansas that has this as their key verse, right, Don Lees? You know that camp? It's New Life Ranch. And it takes 2 Corinthians 5, 17 as its theme verse, which says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's a good memory verse. It's a good reminder that God has done and is doing new things among those who are, are among us who are his children. So this morning, I want us to celebrate the new year by looking at what the Bible tells us about what's new. What God declares is new for those who are his. 
We're going to look at four things this morning. Before we do that, let's pray together. Pray with me. Lord, as we turn to your word this morning, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds that we might hear and understand and obey your word. Help us live as new men and new women in the new year. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the Greek language, there are two words, that two different words that are translated into English as new. The first one is the word neos. The word neos means something that has just recently appeared. It wasn't here yesterday. It's here today. It's new. It just showed up. Today is a new day because it arrived. It's here. So it's new in time. The other word is kenos, and it means new in quality. We don't know if this new year is going to be a kenos year or not. We know it's new in time, but we don't know if it's going to be new in quality. It's a different kind of new. You know, if somebody says to you, I repaired your vehicle and now it's better than new, what they're saying is I've made the quality better than it was before. Think about the iPhone 7 for a minute. If you went to the Apple Store on September 15th, you could not get the iPhone 7. It was not on the shelf yet. It was in the back, but they weren't allowed to bring it out and sell it to you yet. It had not arrived. So the next day when it showed up, it was new because it was now on the shelf, but it was also new because it had design features that were upgrades. It was both Neos and Kanos. But some things that are new are just new in time, other things that are new are new in quality. The Bible says that we are new creatures in Christ, new creations, and it uses the word kenos. When we are new in Christ, when, we, when you are in Christ, when you become a Christian, the Bible says you become a new creation. Now, the same you is still there, right? Right? You did not go to bed a non-Christian and wake up a different person the next day in one sense. You still look the same the next morning. You still weighed the same the next morning. You still spoke the same. You still thought the same. But now there was something qualitatively different about you. There was a kenos. And this is what got Nicodemus tripped up. You remember in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus came to Jesus and he says, how does this work? And Jesus says, you have to be made new. You have to have a new birth. And he goes, how does that work? I climb back in my mother's womb. He was thinking new as in neos. But Jesus went on to explain to him, you don't understand. We're talking about a qualitatively new birth that you have to have. Other places in, in the New Testament, Paul talks about this new birth, this new creation, in terms of being the new self so in Colossians 3, we see don't lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So here's what Paul says. God has given you a new self, a new you. What you have to do is put off the old you and put on the new you in order for that new you to be functioning. It says the same thing in Ephesians 4. It says, that is not, this is Ephesians 4, verse 20. That is not the way you learn Christ, he says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, and the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Boy, there's a lot there. I wish we could just kind of take time to talk about renewing the mind as a process of, of putting on the new self and becoming the new creation that God has called us to be. But this is what's true about all who are in Christ. You've been made new, fresh start, new beginning, a whole new you. This is the time of year when you start seeing weight loss ads, right? And the new ads all say things like you know Jenny Craig or Nutrisystem it's all about new year new you it's it's the new you and all they're saying is that this new you it's the same you you just don't weigh as much well when the bible talks about you being new having a new self it's not talking about a change in your physical makeup it's talking about a change in your spiritual makeup and the question is what exactly is new 
for one who is a new creation in Christ. And here we're going to move back in history to Augustine of Hippo in the 4th century, and we're going to switch from Greek to Latin, okay? I'm going to teach you a couple of Latin phrases that Augustine uh, talked about when he was writing back in the 4th century. Augustine was a church pastor. He was the bishop, which meant that he had he worked with the other pastors in North Africa. In Hippo was the town where he lived uh, along the northern sea coast in Africa. He was, uh, Augustine's a well-known church father. He was a reprobate throughout his early life. Uh, his mother, Monica, prayed for him regularly. Uh, but he had rejected her faith. She was a believer and had lived a profligate life, was immoral, and, um, and all of a sudden one day he was, he was wrestling with reality and life and nature and existence, and he was out in his courtyard one day, and there were some school children who were walking by the courtyard, and they were singing a little song, and the little song said, take up and read, take up and read, take up and read. And he thought, okay. So he went over to a Bible that was sitting out on his courtyard shelf he picked it up he flipped it open and the word of God came alive to him spoke to him pierced his conscience and he was converted on the spot he went on to become a church leader probably the most significant church leader of the first 500 years of the church and here's what Augustine as he began to study the Bible and see what it says about being a new creation in Christ he talked about, he, there were, here are the three Latin words you have to know to know what Augustine's talking about. The first is the word passe, not posse. This is passe. It means able, possible. It, so something that's passe is something that, that, is, that is able. Then second is the word non, which means not. And then the third is the word picare, which means to sin. So we talk about people having peccadillos. It's the same root. It's the same. You've got these bad habits, these peccadillos. So passe non peccare. And he said that when Adam was created, before Adam rebelled against God, Adam was both able to sin and he was able not to sin. So in Latin, that means he was passe peccare and passe non peccare. He was able to sin, but he was also able not to sin. When he rebelled against God, his nature changed. And what he lost was the ability to not sin. So Adam, as fallen man, and everybody who followed him, their state is non passe, non peccare, not able to not sin. Now that sounds, some of you are going, oh wait, you're telling me that anybody who's not a Christian can't not sin? That they constantly sin all the time? I have friends, I have neighbors who are good people. They do nice things. And I go, that's true. Do any of them do any of it for the glory of God? No, it's not in their nature to do it for the glory of God. They don't even de they deny his existence. They don't surrender their lives to him. The good deeds they do are for self-edification, are for self-advancement, are so they can sleep together at night. The, somebody who does a sacrificial act as a non-believer is still doing it out of a self-motivation, not out of a God-glorifying motivation. That's what we mean when we say that the unbeliever who's apart from Christ, is not able to not sin because everything he does is for someone else's glory other than God. And that was you before you came to Christ. You were not able to not sin. Everything you did, you did for your own glory or for the glory of somebody other than Jesus. So that's the state of fallen man. He's not able to not sin. Now, when you surrender your life to Christ and God makes you a new creation, here's what he does. He gives you back what Adam had. Now all of a sudden, you are able to sin, and you're able to not sin again. Okay, So now you have the power in you to no longer sin. You still have the power to sin, so they're both still there, but God gives you back the power to not sin. And by the way, there's a fourth state of man that is coming, 
And that's glorified man, and glorified man will be unable to sin. And Lord, come quickly and bring that, right? Right? It, it, there will be a day coming when it will be impossible for you to sin. When you won't have the desire, you won't have the motivation, it will be gone from you. You will be wholly sanctified and fully glorified in God's presence. That will not happen in this life. So here's the biggest thing that's new about you if, in fact, you are a new creation in Christ. The biggest thing is that it is now possible for you not to sin. Now, you still have old habits and old patterns. You still have old sin desires that keep you, they keep tripping you up, they keep getting you into trouble with yourself and with others. It's still there plaguing you because it's still possible for you to sin. And the world and the flesh and the devil keep calling you, come on, you'll enjoy this. This will be good. You'll like it. Do it. So you're tempted by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the patterns are there, but here's the difference. You now have the power in you. By the way, it's the same power that raised Jesus from death to life. You have that power in you to keep you from sinning. If you have that power in you, why do you still sin? You know why? Because you want to. Sorry to break it to you, but the reason you sin is because ultimately you want to, because you're weak, and sometimes you're hungry, and sometimes you're angry, and sometimes you're lonely, and sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you just want to sin. You just think to yourself, I don't care I'm going to find pleasure there. And then you try it and you learn there is pleasure in sin for a season. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. Now, please do not say the reason I sin is because I'm only human. Only human means non passe, non picare, not able to not sin. Only human is that. But you are more than only human. You are a new creation in Christ. It is now possible for you to not sin. When you sin, it's on you. Okay. Now here's, here's a little comfort there. You're in good company when you sin. Okay. By the way, you're in a room full of fellow sinners. And the Apostle Paul, who we tend to think of as a pretty good, said, there are things I hate, I end up doing. So the reality is the lure of sin is a strong lure. Why we fall to it. The question is, and we face this every day. Some people... ...to it, and they just say, well, thank God I'm under grace. Okay. okay. For now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is indeed good news. But the person who kind of waves it off and says, well, I'm under grace is not the person that I hear and talking about doing battle with it regularly. The, the Bible language, when he said, there are things I hate, I end up doing. He hated those things. What I hear people saying today is, there are things I know I shouldn't do that I end up doing. I don't really hate them all that much. In fact, I kind of like them. I like to pet my sin from time to time. Do you battle sin, or is it something that you feel guilty about or bad about, but you don't really do anything to fight it? You say, well, what do you mean? How do you, how do, you do battle against sin? Well, you go to war against it. You determine it is, in fact, indeed the enemy, and it must be mortified. That means put to death. That doesn't mean managed. That doesn't mean tamed. That means killed. Jesus said, if your right hand is sinning, what should you do? cut it off. He doesn't mean that literally. He means if your right hand is sinning, you should look at that as so bad that you'd be willing to cut it off if it would stop you from sinning. It wouldn't. You'd still have your left hand, 
this is my left hand. I'm, I know I was talking right hand and showing my left, but I do know which is which, okay? <laughs> we have to go to war, go to battle against sin. We have to, the, the Bible uses language like we buffet our bodies. That's not we buffet our bodies. I know some of you thought that's what that was. It's we buffet our bodies. It, we strain, we labor, we strive, we work out our salvation. We fight for holiness in our lives. And we learn how to, replace. this is important, we learn not just how to put off sin, but how to put on the replacement. Because if you spend all your time putting off sin and you don't put on the replacement, all you've done is left an, an unclothed mannequin in the window and, and the sin patterns will find their way back. Jesus, you remember Jesus talking about, and some of you wondered what this parable was all about. You remember he told somebody about the house that had a demon in it and the guy goes in, he sweeps out, or he, he gets the demon out and then he sweeps the house all clean and what happens? Seven denim, demons come back. And have you ever read that and thought, what is he talking about there? Here's what I think he's talking about there. He says some of us will look at a sin pattern in our life and we say, I'm going to get rid of this sin pattern. So we go to war, we fight that sin pattern, and then we sweep our house clean. We, we're going to, okay, now my house is clean, but we don't do anything to refill it with godly virtues. We don't put on the new man. We don't put on kindness, compassion, humility, gentleness, the things the Bible talks about. If you don't do that, you leave the house empty. The demons just look around and say, hey, there's, they cleaned up the house. Let's get our buddies and move back in. So we have to start by agreeing that sin against God is indeed a big deal. Recognize that God has given you his spirit to do war against sin. And as a new creation, that's what putting on the new self looks like. So you have a new self. You have power over sin. It is now possible for you to not sin. The question is, in the new year, are you going to live and work as a new creation? Are you going to put the power over sin to work? Or is this going to be same old, same old? That's why people make resolutions, because they look at their life and they say, I don't want it to be same old, same old. There are things that need to be addressed in my life. Here's the second thing the Bible says is new for all who are in Christ. We have been given a new commandment, a new commandment. You remember Jesus saying this in John 13, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I've loved you. You also love one another and by this all people will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. This is, this is something new. This is not a neos new commandment because this commandment was in the Old Testament. You can find this in your Old Testament. So this is not something where the disciples heard this, love one another, and they go, I've never heard that before. No, they'd heard this before. This was a uh, kenos new commitment, a kenos new commitment that said something is different about how we're to love one another than it's ever been before. There's something qualitatively new. We now have the indwelling Holy Spirit who empowers us and makes it possible for us to love one another. I want to read you an article that came from the Daily Beast website earlier this year. Have you ever go to the Daily Beast? It's not, it's not a place where you go for the latest Christian news, okay? Here's the article. The headline was, Why are so many Muslim refugees in Europe suddenly finding Jesus? Dateline Amsterdam. Hundreds of Pakistanis and Afghans have been lining up at local swimming pools in Hamburg, Germany, to be baptized as Christians. In the Netherlands and Denmark as well, many are converting from Islam to Christianity, and the trend appears to be growing. This is from six months ago. Indeed, converts are filling up some of Europe's churches that have been largely forsaken by their old Christian flocks. The German pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Berlin calls the conversion phenomenon a gift from God. In his modest community, a staggering 1,200 Muslims, mostly Afghans and Iranians, have converted in three years. In Hamburg, where the German ARD TV showed the Pakistanis and Afghans lining up to be baptized by the pastor of a Persian church community, more than 600 people reportedly were received into the congregation. 
There's no reliable overall figure for converts in Northern Europe, but judging by reports from different media outlets, it's safe to assume the number runs into the thousands, maybe even the tens of thousands, who say they want the gospel, the good news offered by Jesus Christ. One, now here, listen. One young Iranian woman converted, told the German news magazine Stern, I've been looking all my life for peace and happiness. In Islam, I've not found them. Another convert told Stern he had found in Christianity an element, love, that was missing from the faith he was brought up in. In Islam, he said, we always lived in fear. Fear God, fear sin, fear punishment. In Christ, there is a God of love. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, and by this all men will know that you are my disciples. Another article I read this week quoted Dudley Woodbury, who is a Fulbright scholar of Islam. He estimates that 20,000 Muslims in the U.S. are becoming Christians every year. He, he, he did a study. He interviewed 750 uh, Christians who come from Muslim backgrounds from around the world, and he asked them, why did you convert to Christianity? And here were the top five reasons. Number one, the lifestyle of the Christians they met. Former Muslims cited the love that Christians exhibited in their relationships with non-Christians and their treatment of women as equals. The number one reason why they are attracted to Christianity is because of the love that Christians have for non-Christians. A new commandment I give you, love one another. The, the other four reasons, the power of God in answer prayer and healing. The Jesus portrayed in the Quran is a prophet who helps lepers and the blind and raises the dead, but often dreams or visions about Jesus or a man of light have been reported. There have been all kinds of prayer. There have been a move of, of God in dreams among Muslims that have been bringing them to faith in Christ. Dissatisfaction with the type of Islam they've experienced. Uh, somebody wrote an article called How ISIS is Spreading the Gospel. Off, he says, I've often referred to the Islamic radicals as proto-evangelists -evangel uh, for the Christian faith. Muslims look at ISIS and say, that's not who we want to be. And then they hear about Jesus and about Christianity and they see it lived out and they're drawn to that. The spiritual truth of the Bible was cited as another reason. And then the last thing, the biblical teaching about the love of God. In the Quran, God's love is conditional. God's love uh, for all people in the Bible, especially eye-opening for Muslims. These converts were moved by the love expressed through the life and the teaching of Jesus. <clears throat> Back in May of 2008, when our church was three and a half months old, I sent out a newsletter talking about the priority of loving one another in our church. And I quoted Tertullian, who's another early church father. Here's what he had to say about the church in his day. He said, we are a body knit together as such by a common religious profession, by unity of discipline, by the bond of a common hope. We meet together as an assembly and congregation that offering up prayers to God as with united force we may wrestle with him in our supplications. We assemble to read the sacred writings. With the sacred words we nourish our faith, we animate our hope, we make our confidence more steadfast, no less by inculcations of God's precepts, we confirm, we, uh, confirm our good habits. Now listen, he says, but it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us. See, they say, how they love one another. They're ready to even die for one another. The thing that caused people in the early church, to, outside of the church, to notice the early church was, oh, how they love one another. I wrote, I'd love to think that as we continue to grow as a church, we would be known by our love for God, love for each other, and love for those who don't know Christ. Wouldn't that be a great thing to be known for? In fact, John says, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who loves not does not know God. What if in the new year, you, we, developed a reputation 
for being extravagant with our love for others? What if we were known for being lavish in our love for others? What if other people said, see how they love one another? They'd, they'd be willing to die for each other. What would happen to Christianity if this is what the church was known for? What if you began every day in 2017 by saying, Lord, give me an opportunity to express love visibly for somebody today? The cashier, the clerk, somebody in my family, somebody at work. Just give me an opportunity to demonstrate lavish love for another person. That's the commandment we have from God, the new commandment. Let me tell you about the third thing that the Bible actually says is new for all who are in Christ. Actually, the Bible doesn't say this is new yet, but it one day will be. And you can turn to this one. Turn to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. If you're new to the Bible, this is the last book of the Bible. You can turn to the last page and go back a few, okay? You'll be right there, Revelation 21. This is the Apostle John receiving this revelation. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, he is seeing what has not yet happened. He is seeing what's ahead in our future. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Does that sound encouraging? Then he says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write this down, for the words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You understand, when Adam rebelled against God and his word back in the perfect Garden of Eden, it wasn't just Adam and Eve who came under the consequences of that rebellion. The earth also came under the consequences. The creation, God's great creation, was marred, was defaced, so that the animals and the trees are different today than they were in the garden. You say, what does that mean? Well, trees die now. In the garden, they didn't die. Animals die now. In the garden, they would not have died. You say, how does that work? I don't understand how all that works, okay? Because I keep thinking, well, if bunnies keep having more bunnies, we're going to be overrun with bunnies, right? <laughs> if none of them die, I don't know how all of that works. But I know that there was no death in the garden until there was a rebellion against God. Romans 8 said that all, says that all creation is groaning. So the rocks and the trees and the animals are going, we hate this. When are we liberated from this death we're under? And Revelation 21 says it's coming. There is a day coming when God will take what is broken and he will repair it and it will be better than new. The garden will look good again, and you'll be there if you know Christ. Those of you who have made it all the way through all seven books of the Chronicles of Narnia, you know when you get to the last book, to the last battle, there's a point at the end of the book, and I don't want to get a little spoiler alert, but if, if you've read the Bible, you know what's coming, okay? There's a spoiler alert when the children pass out of Narnia, into this new land and they can't go back to Narnia anymore. 
and Lucy is sad about the fact that they can't go back to Narnia anymore. And then she realizes what she's seeing in front of her. And she says, those hills, the nice woody ones and the blue ones behind, aren't they very like the southern borders of Narnia? Like, cried Edmund after a moment's silence. Why, they're exactly like. Look, there's Mount Pyre with its forked head. There's the pass into Archenland with everything. And yet, said Lucy, they're different. They have more colors on them. They look further away than I remember, and they're more... More like the real thing, said Lord Diggory softly. Suddenly, Farsight the eagle spread his wings, soared thirty or forty feet into the air, circled round, and then alighted on the ground. Kings and queens, he cried, we have all been blind. We are only beginning to see where we are. From up there, I've seen it all. Ettensmuir, Beaver's Dam, the Great River, Ker Paravel, still shining on the edge of the Eastern Sea. Narnia is not dead. This is Narnia. The eagle is right, said Lord Diggory. The Narnia you're thinking of was only a shadow or a copy of the real Narnia, which has always been here and always will be here, just as our own world, England, is, is and uh, our own world, England and all, is only a shadow or a copy of something in Aslan's real world. You need not mourn over Narnia, Lucy. All of the old Narnia that mattered, all the dear creatures have been drawn into the real Narnia through the door, and of course it's now different as different as the real thing is from the shadow, or waking life is from a dream. The new Narnia was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. I can't describe it any better than that. If you ever get there, you'll know what I mean. It was a unicorn who summed up what everyone was feeling. He cried, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. I get chills reading that. I get chills because we live in the Shadowlands. And when you look at the Rocky Mountains and you go, oh, they're spectacular. You ain't seen nothing yet. When you look at God's creation and you go, this is magnificent, you're seeing a shadow. It's like being in a dream. Wait till you see the real thing liberated from the bondage of sin. One day all things will be made new. God makes all things new. Last new thing we're going to look at this morning. The reason why we can celebrate that we are new creations in Christ. The reason why we, we have a new self, the reason why we can obey the new commandment, and the reason why we can look forward to a new heaven and a new earth is because Jesus has made a new and living way to the Father. Hebrews 10, Therefore, brothers, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. We have a new way, and Hebrews tells us it's a new way because you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels and festal gatherings, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the blood sprinkled that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And Romans 7 says it this way, We are now released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. Look, we, we've got no idea what 2017 holds for us. I don't know if this is going to be a year of great joy for you or a year of deep sorrow. I would hope that it would be a year of joy and prosperity, but I don't know. I, I would hope it would be a year in which we thrive, but it could be a year in which you wallow. But we go into a new year with hope and joy and peace and confidence because we are beneficiaries of a new covenant. That is a new promise that God has made to us, and he secured the promise through the death 
of Jesus. Here's the promise. The promise is when you surrender your life to Jesus, you become adopted as his child into his kingdom. He pours out his love for you. He will never leave you or forsake you. You belong to him now, and that'll never change. That's the new promise. And why do you get that promise? Not because of anything you've done, but because Christ has already done everything required for that to happen. The old covenant, by the way, the old covenant is still in effect. Anyone who keeps the law perfectly can have access into the presence of God. That's still true. Anybody who lives a life that is sinless can still have access into the presence of God by virtue of their sinless life. What's the problem? The problem is that we are not able to not sin. That's the problem. So God has made a new and living way through a new covenant. He said, okay, the old covenant, which still exists, but nobody can keep, I'm making a new promise. My new promise is this, that because my son obediently kept the law perfectly, I will transfer to your account his righteousness and I will give you what he earned and what you don't deserve. That's this new and living way that is pictured for us here in these communion elements, that as we come to take communion, as we come to receive them every week, here's what you are affirming if you come this morning and receive the elements. You're affirming that you're a child of God, and you're affirming this, that your only comfort in life and death is that with body and soul, both in life and death, you are not your own, but you belong to your faithful Savior, Jesus, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied all of your sins, has delivered you from the power of the devil, preserves you so that without the will of your heavenly Father, not a hair from your head can fall. That all things will be subservient to your salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures you of eternal life and makes you sincerely willing, willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. That's what we said at the very beginning when we said the question answer one from the Heidelberg Catechism this morning. You're saying again when you come and receive the bread and the juice, you're saying these elements are my reaffirmation. As I take this, I am stating again that this is what matters to me, that my only comfort my only hope is in Jesus. That's where new life is found. That's where the power to keep the commandment to love one another comes from. That's where the hope of the new heaven and the new earth is found. It's found in trusting yourself to the new covenant that God has made with us in Christ. If you're here with us as a visitor this morning, we take communion every week. We practice it as open communion, which means we leave it up to you as a matter of conscience to determine whether you should come forward and get these elements or not. Here's what we would say to you. You shouldn't come unless you can stand and say, I am a a new covenant person. I, I'm a new creation in Christ. I've surrendered my life to him and, and I, I want to live for him. If that is not your testimony here this morning, if, if you can't say that here this morning, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with Christ, but I just want to encourage you not to come and get bread and juice this morning because this is a meal for the family of God. We're not trying to exclude you from anything. We're just trying to say this is what God has set up as a meal for his children who have made that profession of faith. For the rest of us here this morning, stop and think about living life as, as the new self in this year. And then as you come to receive the bread and the juice, come to receive strength and grace from God that you might live out uh, your new self in the new year. You take a few minutes to prepare your hearts while I prepare the table, and then we'll come down the outer aisles to receive the elements, go back to your seat through the center aisle, hold on to the elements, and we'll take communion together here in just a minute.
because you're ready this morning. Jesus took something old and made it new when at the Passover meal. He took something that children of Abraham had been doing for centuries, and he said, there's going to be something new here. He took the bread, and after he had prayed a prayer of blessing, he broke it, and he passed it. He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, instead of remembering the, the deliverance from Egypt remember me the deliverance from bondage to sin the, the new life that is offered you and so Lord Jesus this morning we do remember that in your death we are given new life that as you offered yourself as a sacrifice you gave us the power to become children of God to all who would believe in your name. And so this morning, Lord, we receive this bread with grateful hearts as we worship Christ in our hearts. Amen. In the same way, after the meal was over, he took the cup, and after he'd prayed a prayer of blessing, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of your sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. And again, Lord, we do remember your new covenant, your new pledge. The old covenant 
is of no use to us. It's, it's, we're hopeless. We can't, we can't abide by its terms, but you have given us a new covenant, a new and living way, and you have replaced our works for your works and invited us by faith to come to you. And so we receive this cup now, grateful that our sins are forgiven and that you have led us on the new way. We feast on Christ in our hearts as we worship him in this cup. Amen. Let's sing the last verse and chorus of what we sang earlier, All Glory Be to Christ. If you don't mind playing that for us again, stand and let's sing that together. And then I'll dismiss us with a benediction here this morning. Let's sing. When on that day the great I... receive this as God's blessing to you as we go. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without, pay uh, without payment. Amen. Amen. Have a great new year. We'll see you back next Sunday.